talk about how to build a, an escrowed market using Monero multisig. Uh, what, what I'm talking about today could be built with today's Monero multisig, but um, what I'm talking about, going to be talking about is a more efficient version that's seamless, as I call it. So per, first we're gonna talk about how uh, multisig works today, or not today, but how multisig works in Monero. So um, multisig is a technology where multiple people can collaborate to build a Monero wallet, and then the multisig group members collaboratively own the funds. So we call this M of N when, if we have a group of size N, so exact, for example, three people, and then M is two, so two of three, then uh, you, you need two people from the group of three in order to make any transaction out of spend, spending from funds from the multisig wallet. So during to set up a multisig account, all of the group members start out with a set of base keys. So there there is a main base key pair which is going to uh, initialize the multisig component. And then there's also a common base key pair, which is uh, used, which is going to be, which is combined, as we see at the bottom here, into the multisig common private key, as, as simply a hash of the, the component private keys from the group members. And this this shared private key is used as the multisig group view private key. So all of the group members have the same view key. And then this private key can also be used to sign messages as as a member of the group. And then also, um, group members have their own personal signing key, which, they, which is used as a member identifier and is required to sign all messages produced by a given group member. And this, these signatures are, are necessary in order to properly validate messages that are passed between group members. So, to set up a multi-sig account, we use a Diffie-Hellman-based key, key exchange uh, algorithm. So in the beginning, the, the group members send all of their, their main key pair pub public keys and also their common key pair private keys to all the other group members. The, the common private keys are uh, immediately combined into the, the, the multi-sig shared group uh, common private key, but the the main main public public keys are used to make uh, different Hellman exchanges. So each each of the group members uses their their main key pair to to produce a, a Diffie Hellman exchange with all of the base public keys of the other group members. So we have a we have shared secrets secrets between each pair. Of group members, so now if um, if we're in an intermediate round, these these Diffie-Hellman secrets are sent directly to all of the other group members, and then in the next round, another Diffie-Hellman exchange is made with these these Diffie, the, the, the prior rounds Diffie-Hellman key pairs. So what you end up with is each each unique key that is produced will have three members. In uh, providing Diffie-Hellman components to the secrets that are produced, and you continue on until you um, have sufficient number of participants in this Diffie these Diff Diffie-Hellman secrets. Um, once once you have that a sufficient number, you instead of sharing the the Diffie-Hellman secrets, you hash them. And, so this is in the last round minus one up here. You hash the secrets, multiply by the the, the multi-sig generator or the the key generator, the, the generator of the key that you want to produce, and then you send these public key shares. So the, these are the key share components of each signer. These are sent to all of the other signers, and then you you combine all of the complete of. Uh, all of the key shares into the completed multi-sig public key. And what we do here is something called um, key aggregation. So we, we 
we have this um, equation here. We, when we're, we're at, we don't add them together uh, directly. We first multiply by a factor that ensures the, that you can't do any, some, something called key cancellation, which uh, violates the multi-sig invariance. And then of course we have the common public key, which is simply the, the shared private key times the generator. So an important security note for the key exchange process is you, you, you must have a post key exchange verification round where you, where you obtain a copy of the completed public key from all of the other members in the group. Um, and then you require that all of the other group members have the same completed final public key. And we do this because uh, if you don't check that all of the other group members have a completed public key, then it's possible that one of them is blocked by a malicious, co a malicious group member and is unable to complete the multisig account, which means that the, the expected group size is actually reduced. And it could be that you're, you have no way to make a signature without the cooperation of that malicious signer who blocked other signers. Now, I came up with some optimizations to this process that can be used um, in, if you properly validate the, or that the, the, you will not break your invariance if you use these optimizations. As, as you can see on the bottom, I say use with care here. So one of, of the optimizations is force updating one of the key exchange rounds so that you can complete a, complete a round with, with fewer sign, so without, without messages from all of the signers. Because normally you expect all of the, all of the so when we had these Diffie-Hellman Diffie exchanges where multiple people have components of the, of the secret, normally you want a recommendation from each of those, each of those members uh, so you receive recommendations from each of those members for, for that copy of the key share, and then you, you verify that all of them have the same uh, recommendation. And you, you, uh, you need that to uphold the invariance of the key exchange process. But when we're force updating, we might only require that one or more of the shareholders of, of, of each given uh, secret recommends that key. The second optimization is something called round boosting, where, um, where so you have, say, one person and then two other people, and let's say we, this person over here gets the messages from messages for the previous key exchange round from those people, and immediately uh, updates their their personal cache to the next round, without without waiting or with without ensuring that the other members are also in lockstep updating their accounts. So basically, the, the other people make incomplete next round messages that, the, that this signer can use to, um, to move forward in the key exchange protocol. Now, if, if these optimizations are used improperly, then you can end up with a key, key hostage attack where a uh, malicious signer is required to participate in all signatures, or you can get a frozen account. For example, if you if you force update the post or the post key exchange verification round, if you force update that, then you could end up, as I discussed earlier, with a situation where um, uh, not all signers are uh, avail able to participate in signing. And so later on, I will, I will point out, so I will, I will use these optimizations in the escrowed market discussion, and then I will point out later on um, how those, those use cases are valid. So when, when you're going to make a multi-sig transaction, you begin with a transaction proposal from one of the group members, which specifies a, the signer set, the, the a subset of size M from the, the group who you want to participate in that, that transaction attempt. And you also specify the transaction inputs and outputs, the fee and the memo um, that you want to be in the transaction. And then each other member can check this transaction protocol 
Uh, they can want, they can create a t transaction simulation from the, the the proposal details and validate that all the that the transaction could theoretically be completed by simulating a transaction. And then you also must check that the inputs of the transaction are owned on chain and on spent, and you must verify that the outputs recorded in that proposal are acceptable. So if you want to, if you want to do, perform a, if you want to sign a multi-sig transaction, you have to go through a signing ceremony, which has three, three components. First, each member initializes the transaction, the, the signature by providing nonces for the signature. Um, in multi-sig, each member is required to provide two nonces to mitigate something called the driver's attack, which is a, a, it's an, a, a very technical attack, but um, very important to mitigate. Otherwise, uh, the, the key shares of other members can be stolen in, in specific situations. And then once you have the nonces from all of the other signers in the subgroup, you respond with partial signatures from each of the members, and then you combine the partial signatures into the full, the full signature. And of course, then you should check that the completed signature is valid. Um, what I implemented in the Seraphis library, or uh, alongside the Seraphis library, library is aggregation style sign signing, where um, you, in advance, you coordinate which key shares will be provided by each of the members. So each of the group members will, or between the group members, there will be duplicates of key shares because e between, su between subsets of the, the group will be uh, shared secrets. And so we have to coordinate which, which members provide which of the shared secrets. And we, we do that by, um, we know in advance which, subs which subgroup will be participating in signing. So we only provide key shares from the lowest member in the subset with a given key share. And then also, in, in um, Monero multi-sig, we have, we have multi-sig signing in a transaction. When you sign a transaction, your signature has two components. It has the, the, the spend private key component and also view key material. And the view key, the view key material is, is known by all of the multi-sig group members, while the, the private key component is split between all of the group members. So the multi-sig signing is all about that, that private spend key. And so we can, we can simply provide, in the multi-sig, in Monero multi-sig transaction signing, each of, the, each of the signers can provide fractional components of the, the, the view key material that is known by all the members. All right, that, with that all the, out of the way, we can discuss how this can be applied to an escrow marketplace with the caveat that what I'm discussing is experimental, incomplete, and in, probably insecure. Hopefully not, but probably. Um, so in an escrow market, we have three players. We have the buyer who encounters a vendor with some product, and we have a third-party arbitrator who will... Um, handle disputes between the buyer and the vendor. So to, in, in this scenario, we use a two or three multi-sig where most of the time we, we expect the buyer and the vendor to cooperate to pass funds from the buyer to the vendor. So buyer into multi-sig to the vendor. Um, so in a two of three, we have, to set up the account, we have three rounds. We begin with the base keys where, so all the base keys are passed to other participants. And then they make Diffie-Hellman exchanges, convert those to public keys between each pair, so um, three sets. And then, um, and then these are sent to all of the other players, and then those are aggregated into the completed uh, public key. And then, of course, th those public keys are expected to be passed around again for the post key exchange verification round. So what we want, what we want, so we want a buyer 
to encounter a vendor, set up their, set up the multi-sig account, fund the multi-sig account, uh, create a transaction, moving funds out of the multi-sig account in, and into the vendor all in one step. And then the, we expect, we want the vendor to, to uh, receive this information, send the product out, um, send a, or be, begin signing the transaction and send that information to the buyer. And then when the buyer receives the product, they complete the transaction and submit it to the network. We don't want the buyer to do any more steps. So we want the buyer to encounter the product and ask for it, receive the product and pay and finish paying. And those are the only two things we want the buyer doing. Which means, so the, the real important, to achieve this workflow, the most important thing is single step buyer setup. So to do this, we use, we use both, of, both of the optimizations that I discussed prior previously. To begin, the vendor cooperates with the arbitrator, so both of them have to be online for the preparation component. The vendor and the arbitrator cooperate to produce the base keys and boosted round two messages. Um, but, so the, the, round two mess, the round two is the Diffie-Hellman exchanges between the, each pair. So the vendor and arbitrator produce uh, Diffie-Hellman public keys, uh, and these between between themselves, but but not between them themselves and the the buyer who who doesn't exist yet. So this is a, this is a speculative setup for the vendor and the arbitrator. So we we say we're boosting round two because the round two message produced is incomplete. It does not contain Diffie-Hellman Diffie -Hellman public keys between, like, for example, the vendor and the buyer. So the, the, the setup information is prepared by the vendor and published alongside their product offer. And then, so the buyer encounters the base keys, the round two boosted messages, and the product offer, which allows him to um, complete the account setup in one step. So. He uses the round the base keys provided by the vendor. He uses the round two messages, which are boosted um, to complete round two. And then he force updates the, the post key exchange validation round. And later on, I will, I will justify the use of these optimizations here. And so for this to be safe, however, um, the buyer needs to know that the arbitrator is alive in some way. So either by, by pinging the arbitrator or through some heuristic uh, that's left up to the implementer. Because if, if, the, if the arbitrator is not alive, then it's possible for funds to be trapped in the address. So once, so the, the, the buyer did their single setup, they, they have a they have a completed account. They fund the account. They make a proposal, fun, removing funds from the account, and send send sends their their uh, setup information, like the the messages they produced while doing account setup. They send all of this information to the vendor, who can now set up his own account um, using so that the vendor. It's important for the vendor to do the normal, the normal account setup process. So he, he uses the buyer and arbitrator's base keys to set up, then he cooperates with the arbitrator um, to, to obtain the round two messages from the arbitrator. Uh, he does round two, he does, he does post key exchange validation, and then he'll have a completed account with two, two important notes here. If, the, if there is no, no arbitrator, then the, the vendor needs to force update his, he needs, to, he needs to set up, he needs to force his account into completion so that the funds which are already in the multi-sig account can be removed from that account one way or another. Now, I say we follow the refund path here because uh, the, the vendor hasn't actually sent the product out yet, so since there's no arbitrator, we might as well refund and 
and abort. And then, of course, we must we caution here that it's very important for the ar arbitrator to validate buyer messages because buyer messages are forwarded through the vendor to the arbitrator. So the, the vendor could, could replace the buyer's messages with anything they want and perhaps set up a sock puppet buyer. Um, I'll discuss later how we prevent that. So here's an overview of the, the escrow setup process. The vendor prepares their account and makes a product offer. The buyer encounters this information, completes their account in a single step, funds, sends funds to the multi-sig account, and then immediately um, produces, uh, produces multi-sig trans er, pr transaction proposals, removing funds from, from the multi-sig account. And we can do this without waiting, in, in Seraphis, we can do this without waiting for the multi-sig multi account um, funds to arrive in the account, so to be unlocked. So we don't have to wait 10 blocks because in Seraphis we can, multi-sig tr or transaction proposals can be chained off of e-notes which are not yet unlocked or even in the chain at all. And then, so when the, the vendor receives all of this information, they complete the account with the arbitrator they wait for the funds to be unlocked or to, to, to be uh, confirmed and unlocked in the account and then sends the, of course, and then sends the product and um, moves for, forward with the um, transfer of funds to the vendor. So here, here's the cooperation route, uh, which I've kind of t talked about, um, alluded to so far. Um, so when the buyer initiates a trade, we, we do this at the same, so this is, we're, we're, this is specifically about the transfer of funds. So the buyer, when the buyer initiates trade, he makes a payment and a refund transaction proposal and initializes those transactions um, and sends all that information to the vendor. So we try to do the payment and the refund paths in parallel as much as possible to uh, uh, improve the user experience. This, as I uh, discussed before, the, the initialization of the trade happens at the same, in the same step as the buyer setup. So the buyer sets up, sets up their account, funds the multi-sig, and initializes the trade. And then the, the vendor receives that information from the buyer and begins begins the transfer. So they, they, they choose, let's see, uh, if, assuming the, the ar so if, if the arbitrator is gone, then, then we simply go to the refund path. Other ways we do both payment and refund paths of this in parallel here. So at, at the vendor's finish, at the vendor finish setup step, the vendor, so the vendor completes his account with the arbitrator and, um, S sends the product to the buyer along with uh, um, initializations for the, the uh, payment and refund transactions. So these are the nonces I talked about before. And then along with partial signatures for just the payment path. We don't want partial signatures for the refund path, otherwise the buyer could simply refund himself immediately. The buyer then receives this, all this information and either receives the product or does not receive the product. If he receives the product, he chooses the payment path, he completes the payment transaction, submits it to the network, sends the transaction ID to the vendor, and then the vendor can later on uh, check that the funds have been sent uh, and close out the trade. If he follows the refund path, then he partially signs the refund transaction and sends that information to the vendor. And then there's a, in the refund path, there's a further step for the vendor who must finalize the refund by making, completing, completing the transaction, submitting it, and then sending the resulting transaction ID to the buyer. Now, if the cooperation path, or the cooperation route, I say, um, does not work out, then we need, to, we need to go through arbitration. So let's say the buyer wants a refund and the vendor is not cooperating. 
he sends sufficient, sufficient account setup information to the arbitrator for the arbitrator to complete their account. And he also creates a, a refund transaction pro proposal and initializes it and sends that to the arbitrator so that the arbitrator um, can, next in the next step, um, approve the refund, just, uh, check that the, the account is funded as expected or after, after um, setting up their account. So the, the arbitrator force updates their account uh, in, one, in one step without, uh, with only with only um, round or round data from the buyer, in addition to the the vendor's uh, base keys, which which can be which can be cached by the arbitrator, and uh, so the the arbitrator can cache the the vendor must register with the arbitrator, and then the arbitrator can later check that uh, vendor information sent by the buyer is properly registered. Um, and then, of course, the, the arbitrator signs the refund transaction, sends it to the buyer, buyer finishes the transfer straightforwardly. And then there's a, the, like the mirror arbitration route for the payment if the vendor wants payment. And all of the steps are the same here. So the uh, information for force updating the account, or force, in, force, um, yeah, force updating the account is sent to the arbitrator. Uh, the, the arbitrator sets up in one step, signs the payment, and vendor finishes it. Okay, so that those are those are the 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 main details um, for the the escrowed market workflow uh, that I'm presenting here. But there are further there are many, there are many many ways this can go horribly wrong. So we we should uh, talk about some go through some safety notes here. So. One, the, the most, the most, the largest danger here is, is, is sock puppets. So vendor is, the vendor, when the vendor, um, the buyer and the arbitrator do not normally con or make contact with each other. So the vendor is forwarding buyer information to the arbitrator during the vendor setup phase. And also when the vendor is, uh, asking for arbitration with the arbitrator. So since, to, to prevent the, the vendor from modifying buyer messages, we require, we require that all transactions funding the account, which are referenced by multi-sig transaction proposals, include proofs that proofs uh, so what a, a transaction funded proof is a proof that the signer of the proof um, sent funds into or created a transaction or funded a specific transaction. So all of the transactions funding the multi-zig account must have a transaction funded proof signing a message from the buyer. So the buyer's information, uh, the the, the vendor product amount and a vendor signature on the product info so that the the product the the transfer that is being done here is locked into the the transaction funded proof and only the buyer is able to make this transaction funded proof because only the buyer um, funds the account and even if the vendor vendor funds the account and produces one of these transaction funded proofs the arbitrator will not cooperate with any multi with any transaction proposal, which uh, which spends spends funds provided by a transaction that does not have a transaction funded proof that maps properly to the, the buyer info um, provided by the provided forwarded by the vendor. Uh, so that that locks in. That, that prevents the vendor from making buyer sock puppets that can cause funds to be removed from the account without following the proper uh, or satisfying the invariance you expect. And on the other side, the when the buyer goes to um, arbitrate with the or get a refund from the arbitrator, 
it's possible that he registered a vendor sock puppet with the arbitrator beforehand and then uses that sock puppet um, to convince the arbitrator to go forward with the refund. So we prevent this by the arbitrator must enforce that, that the vendor base public keys, which are used to um, used for the um, multi-stake setup are unique. The, we expect that the vendor only registers uh, his, his, his base keys before any, before any product offers. So there's no, there are no race conditions between the vendor and the buyer. And then, and then obviously we, we require that the arbitrator um, expect all vendor messages are signed by a registered vendor ID. And now we can see why the optimizations that I've uh, mentioned throughout the talk are, are valid. So there are four, four cases here. During, during buyer setup, the, the vendor and arbitrator boost round two, and then the buyer uses those boost, boost messages to boost his own round two. And this is valid because the vendor and arbitrator don't need an account yet, so it's, um, it's acceptable for um, the buyer to go forward with his account completion without um, without interacting with the buyer and arbitrator or the vendor arbitrator. Then also during buyer setup, we force update the post key exchange verification round, um, which is which I consider valid because we assume that the arbitrator is honest and available, and we know in advance that any arbit any refund arbitration. Um, can be completed by just the buyer and the arbitrator. So there's no need to um, there's no need to check that the vendor is available or not because because arbitrator setup only requires the buyer or the vendor. Then the vendor during, during the vendor when if there's no arbitrator and the vendor has to do a refund, he force updates rounds two and three which is valid because the vendor is on the refund path and has no stake in uh, the funds in the multi-stake account. So on only the buyer has stake and only the buyer has uh, provided key exchange messages. Uh, now, the, in both of the arbitration paths, we have the arbitrator force updating both, two round, both of rounds two and three, which I consider valid because the arbitrator has no stake and before the account setup, the arbitrator has already decided that the setup partner who is, who is collaborating with this force updating situation has full stake of the uh, funds in the multi-sig account. So even if there's no, there's no reason for that partner to, or there's nothing to be gained by that partner for uh, violating any of the, multi, the usual multi-sig invariants. And then finally, um, if, if we need arbitration and there's no arbitrator, then pro you could technically implement a, a vendor buyer split funds protocol um, as a fallback. And then and, and also one an important thing to note about this protocol is that the buyer, the buyer has privacy versus the arbitrator in the cooperation path. So most of the time, the arbitrator should learn nothing about the buyer because the ar arbitrator can assist vendor setup without the buyer contact details. The, buy the, vend the arbitrator does not need to validate, does not need these transaction funded proofs. Ex or these, these, these proofs are only needed on the arbitration paths. So the, the buyer info here does not need to be sent to the to the arbitrator, except in the arbitration paths. So importantly, the arbitrator um, learns nothing about the buyer other than the buyer's base keys and round, round two keys um, in, in the typical path. That is the end. Thank you. Thank you.